Welcome Wine Vault to Trefethen 2.0. This is our second wine dinner with you. We're so thankful that Chris asked us to have us back. And uh, we're looking at the menu that Chef Gregory has put together for you. It looks delicious. Um, so I am Lorenzo Trefethen here with my sister Haley. You probably could have said that. And we are the third generation here at Trefethen. <laughs> Uh, we're standing here today in front of our historic winery. So this building was built as a winery in 1886. And at that time, there were actually over 140 wineries in the valley. It was a thriving, amazing wine industry on not only kind of a national level winning awards in San Francisco, but also internationally winning awards in Paris. Uh, absolutely fantastic area that we're in and growing region and it's proven itself since then. But we had Prohibition, two world wars, and phylloxera. Few things. Just a few. <laughs> and so that number from 140 in the 1800s actually plummeted down to less than 25 wineries when our grandparents came and bought this property in 1968. And in 1968, vineyards weren't even the main thing that were in Napa Valley. Most of Napa Valley was planted to orchards and the cattle industry was really sort of the main thing going on. So when our grandfather started ripping out walnut trees in order to plant grapevines, everyone thought he was absolutely crazy. And then when our parents started making wine um, right here in this building, everyone thought they were crazy too because there was no American fine wine industry and that's what they set out to do here. And we have uh, really stuck to some of our founding principles um, for the last 50 years and the last three generations. We only make wine from the grapes that we grow right here on our estate in the Oak Knoll District. And Haley's gonna take you out to see where some of the magic happens, I think. Yeah, let's go. All right, here we are out in the vineyard. And as my brother mentioned, we are 100% estate grown. So everything we do, comes from right here. Um, we do everything from planting every single vine to caring for them throughout the season. And so right now it's an exciting time. It's right at the beginning of Verasion. So we're actually starting to see some color on the berries. And so what happens in this time is we, the vine stops thinking about growing vegetation and it starts focusing its energy on ripening those berries, getting us ready for harvest. Uh, so it's a sign that harvest is coming and there's lots of excitement going on. A few of the other things that we're doing in the vineyard right now, uh, we actually have a tractor in this block that's doing weed control. We don't use any herbicide. We do all of our weed control manually. Uh, and so they're in here kind of going and cutting off any roots of the weeds and cleaning everything up, making sure that there's not a lot of competition for these vines. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is we're going in and we're actually crafting the light environment around every single cluster. So we want nice morning dappled light on these clusters, not full direct sunlight, especially on the afternoon side. And so here we are and this is the side that's going to get a little bit of that morning light. And so you can kind of see you almost have like a little baseball cap over every single cluster. And then on the other side of the vine that gets that hotter afternoon sun, we're gonna leave a little bit more leaves to make sure that that gives it some nice shade but still has good airflow around it. So we have our own team in the vineyard that works for us year round and they're the ones who do all of this. Uh, this is actually a block of our Cabernet Franc and so we grow nine different varieties on the property. And today you're gonna get a chance to taste, I think five of them, cause we have a blend for you. Uh, and so it's really fantastic that we have all these different varieties on property that need attention at different times. If our entire vineyard was all Chardonnay, everything would need attention at once and there'd be no way that we could get to it with our own team. But because we have these different varieties, we can slowly work our way around the property, giving everything attention exactly when it needs it. All right, thank you, Haley. Um, uh, now we're in the garden, and we've got our first wine for you to enjoy, the 2019 Trefeth and Chardonnay. And uh, we're here on a classic Oak Knoll District morning. These, uh, this marine layer that's keeping the sun out um, keeps us nice and cool. 
in the morning. It'll burn off in the afternoon and the sun will come out, the vines will spend a little bit of time in the warmth of the afternoon, and then right around, you know, early afternoon, the leaves start to rustle, our natural air conditioning kicks on, these marine breezes come back and cover us again in cool climate, cool temperatures, nice fog, um, and that really preserves the brightness in the wine uh, across all of our wines, um, but absolutely critical for our Chardonnay. And this was the first wine that we had a real success with. I mentioned when we got started, no one was doing much here <laughs> when it came to, to wine. And uh, Chardonnay was actually, this is kind of crazy to, to think about today, but Chardonnay was a very weird choice to be planting because it was unheard of outside of Burgundy and Champagne, and there wasn't even called Chardonnay. Um, people just were drinking white Burgundy and Blanc de Blanc Champagne. Uh, so when my grandfather planted our vineyard here, we basically doubled the amount of Chardonnay produced in the Napa Valley, and that turned out to be a very good gamble, um, because in 1979, this was declared the best Chardonnay in the world in Paris at what was at the time the largest wine tasting the world had ever seen. And that shocked everybody, no one more so than my parents. Um, my mother uh, received the news and she went back to these notebooks that she kept. Um, she had, she was basically our entire marketing and sales department. And she opened these books where she was, uh, you know, basically Salesforce before there was Salesforce. She had everything written down about anybody who'd ever called in um, interested in a bottle of Trefethen. And in most cases, she actually physically went and visited them. Um, things like refrigeration weren't so common at the time, and we wanted to make sure that our wines were being presented in the right way. And uh, she looked through this book, and she's the next journalist that called to get our comment on this crazy result. Um, she said, I'm sorry, there must be a mistake. We don't have any wine in France. We've never sold a bottle to anyone in France. There's no way that we could possibly be in this competition. And so it wasn't until the CBS News helicopter landed on our cellar door uh, about a week later that we realized that we'd actually won this thing. Um, as you might imagine, there were some rather disgruntled wine producers in Burgundy who were none too happy with this result. And they challenged the results, uh, demanding a rematch which took place the following year, and they took over the uh, palace, the palace of the Dukes of Burgundy, um, right in sort of the heart of, uh, of Burgundy, and um, they reassembled all the wines from the year before, um, brought in some Grand Cru wines that they had not been tasting the wine bef the year before, and we won again. Um, so uh, that was also a surprise. We were not invited to attend either tasting. Um, this all came together uh, and, and uh, we, we found, about, found out about it after the fact, but those two tastings, the 79 Wine Olympics and the 1980 rematch, were two of the early results that really brought attention to the Napa Valley and told the world of wine that something special was going on here. And there is indeed something special going on in this glass, we have really stayed true to the uh, philosophy um, that was behind the wine that won, um, and this wine that you have is also still winning. Uh, last year, it participated in the largest wine tasting in the world, much bigger um, tasting than we won in 1979, and after tasting through more than 16,500 wines, this emerged as the best white wine from North America. And when you taste it, it might be a bit of a pleasant surprise. Um, in the world of sometimes oaky, buttery Chardonnay, this is not one of them. Um, this is a wine that is really guided by the land. Um, this is a refrain you'll hear over and over throughout this tasting. We are 100% estate grown, and what we want you to taste is what Haley was just out in. We want you to taste the vineyard, we want you to taste this place. Our winemaking is just a tool to enhance that. Um, and as you uh, have no doubt at this point pulled, I'm sorry, it says New England uh, shrimp and 
crab bowl, but I can't, I can't even say it without going southern. So get your shrimp and your crab bowl out. Um, and uh, this is going to be a lovely pairing. Um, those, the, the shrimp that you left the shell on and the crab really bring out um, the minerality in the wine when you're tasting it. Uh, that charred lemon um, is also going to bring out some of the citrus notes in the wine. The sausage that's in the bowl um, is uh, going to coat your, your mouth with fat and really pair beautifully with the bright uh, citrus acidity in the wine. Um, and then the melon salad that you have on the side is just a classic pairing with Chardonnay, really bringing out more of the tropical fruit um, in the wine. And uh, this is this is it. This is the Trefethen Chardonnay. This is the, the wine that got us started and the wine that really um, continues to do great things here in the Napa Valley, really leading the charge for Napa Chardonnay. Cheers! The next wine you're gonna be enjoying tonight is our 2018 Merlot. Now, Merlot is an incredible variety. It sometimes doesn't get all the attention that I think it should have. So Merlot has an incredible lush mid palette. It doesn't necessarily have the length of Cabernet, but that mid palette is dense and wonderful and really allows it to go with a lot more different kinds of foods. So it's actually paired with chicken tonight. And that is a sense of why Merlot is kind of so flexible when it comes to food. It's great with anything that kind of has these really stewed or really cooked tomatoes, which you're gonna have on the side tonight. And tomatoes that are cooked down and kind of really get that caramelization and tone down that acidity a little bit are a great bridge to red wine and especially Merlot. So on another night, if you guys wanna have like a roasted tomato pasta or pizza, Merlot can handle that as well, but it's gonna be fantastic with the dish that you have tonight. Also those roasted vegetables, everything like that, all of that kind of caramelization that you're gonna get is gonna play really well with the tan in here. And again, you're taking those kind of like really bold, dense wine and playing with it with all those different flavors. Um, the way that we make Merlot is why it can fluctuate between kind of white meats and red meats as well as those pizzas and pastas. So this vintage is 10% Cabernet and 90% Merlot. And so I mentioned that it doesn't always have that length of Cabernet, so that's why we blend that little bit of Cabernet in there um, to just kind of help kind of lengthen it and give it that extra little bit of tannin on the finish. Uh, mm, okay. I love smelling this wine almost as much as I enjoy drinking it, so do take that time to really smell all those aromas. Merlot's history on our property is pretty interesting. So we've grown Merlot since the very beginning, um, and so we had it planted in the 70s and the 80s, but we never actually made a varietal Merlot until the mid 90s. And it's because it took us a little bit to figure out how to really dial it in and grow it in the vineyard. But once we did, we found that it loves the Oak Knoll District. It is one of our shining stars in this appellation and off of our property, it's something we're incredibly proud of. And so we have been making this Merlot since the 90s. And again, just enjoy that density and how lovely it is gonna pair with tonight's wine and over and over again in your house because it's fantastic. Cheers. Here we are with Dragon's Tooth in the most fitting setting we could possibly come up with. Uh, isn't this magical? My grandmother planted these redwoods, which is amazing. They are really, really tall. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, um, in the vineyard, were planting some interesting things. Uh, in the early 2000s, including Malbec and Petit Verdot. We were among the first people in Napa to plant either of those two varieties. Uh, really looking to just kind of complete the Bordeaux set to get all of the Bordeaux varieties um, in our vineyard so that we could have it for purposes of blending. Um, and the first barrels we made totally surprised us. Uh, we got way more than we thought and we started playing around with them and we realized um, we had more than grapes for blending. We had grapes that wanted to say something for themselves. And as we started uh, working with them, we realized that these two grapes, Malbec and Petit Verdot, they fit together like two pieces of a puzzle. Um, Malbec is 
Very generous, very friendly, very luscious, fruity wine. A lot of mountain berry fruit, boysenberry. There's a little bit of blueberry in there, which is very distinctive. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's a friendly wine, but it doesn't have a terrible amount of structure. Um, Petit Verdot, on the other hand, um, it's got a little bit of like floral notes, but it has almost no fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's got gobs of structure. It is just a tannic behemoth of a wine. And um, it sort of, you know, they each fill in um, where the other is weak, the other is strong. And when we put them together, we, we began to have a really complete wine. Um, and we started, you know, doing the whole blending thing and we ended up with this very unique expression of the vineyard where um, Dragon's Tooth is about this dance, this interplay of Malbec and Petit Verdot with Cabernet Sauvignon often, um, but not always, playing a supporting role. Uh, this vintage, we do have quite a bit of Cabernet um, knitting the two uh, Malbec and Petit Verdot together, really filling out that mid palette. Um, and it is uh, what we affectionately refer to as our upside down Bordeaux blend. Um, usually you'd have like Cabernet with maybe a little bit of Malbec Petit Verdot in it. We flipped it entirely on its head and ended up with this amazing wine. Just look at it. That is not a normal color. Um, that is like inky purple. And that is again the uh, combination of Malbec, which is like hyper purple when you crush it, and Petit Verdot, which is this inky black, and um, trains going by. I don't know if you can hear that. That's a nice little background noise. Um, and we're gonna have to uh, send someone out to take care of that. Um, and uh, we, uh, we, we put this blend together, and as far as we know, um, we're the only people in the world uh, doing anything like this with these two varieties. So not only is this wine uniquely from our vineyard, it is uniquely our own blend. Um, the Dragon is a sort of family heirloom, <laughs> if you will. It's right off the Welsh flag um, in honor of my grandmother who is Welsh and the original wine lover in the family. And we always wanted to do something with the Red Dragon of Wales. And when we made this blend, as you taste it, that sort of overwhelming intensity and structure come together and we were just like, yep, this is the dragon wine. Uh, and then when we finally had enough, because you know we planted a little bit, we thought, for blending, and then we got this whole new wine. So it took us quite a few years before we even had the grapes um, to produce this wine. And over that time, as we started to learn about them, we began planting in some of our rockiest soils. And one of the minerals that we have in our soils is a, uh, a rock called obsidian. It's volcanic glass. It's basically black glass that when it shatters, uh, it shatters just like glass into little sharp shards that as you're walking through the vineyard, you sometimes see what looks like a little small black reptilian tooth. And so dragon's tooth, though a fanciful name, refers to the two things that have always defined us, family and vineyard. Now let's get to what you're eating. Those, that lamb is a perfect choice for Dragon's Tooth. The dragon loves beast. Um, and uh, the gamier the better to some extent. That's really gonna play well with the fruitiness of the uh, Malbec, gonna bring out a lot of that berry fruit. And then um, the mousseline that's accompanying it is really gonna play really nicely with the tannin that the Petit Verdot has so much of to give. Um, so, cheers, enjoy. Cheers, wine vaulters. It's <laughs> good, I see what you did there. Um, we hope you enjoyed the wine and uh, come visit us sometime in the beautiful Napa Valley. We'd love to see you. We have some pretty fantastic wine and food experiences here as well that we would love to share with you. Cheers. <laughs>